where does true innovation really come from? And we've been surprised so many times when we played with stuff. And we're, What's that? Huh? Uh, hold on. And we're like trying to figure out what it does. So this kind of accidentally stumbling across something and then figuring out how to harvest that and make a product out of it that people can use and play with. That's our thing. That's where SPL is strong. My name is Hermann Gier. I'm the managing director and co-founder of uh, SPL. And we're here in our studio in Niederkrichten in the Rhineland area in Germany. We've always been here. So we started out in that, in that area and we went to different places here, got bigger and bigger facilities to accommodate for everything. Meanwhile, we're like having 18 people working here at SPL in R&D and marketing. And we have another 17 people in the production facility next door. Our product range is split into two main categories, the pro audio side and the hi-fi side. So since about 2015, we started doing hi-fi products, which is very successful for us. But with, we started out as a company with pro audio, with 19-inch rack mount effects. Meanwhile, we split our range into mastering products, which you see over here, and the plugins like the PQ that is derived out of that mastering series, as well as the studio range, where we have monitor controllers, headphone amplifiers, compressors, limiters, all of, all of that stuff. We're driven by innovation. That has always been the key point. We've done so many uh, new designs in our history, like the Vitalizer in the first place, the Transient Designer, the Phonator Matrix, we designed our own core technology, our own op amps, like which is now known as the 120 volt rail technology. So not many companies at all do really develop operational amplifiers to work with. There's only a few, a handful of companies doing it. So yeah, we're driven by innovation and we're like, we kept our favor for playing with electronics. So most of these innovations come out of experiments and just playing with music, listening to music, see what happens. The design usually takes about, well, some are done within three or four months. Others take seven years. We had products where we just started, like with the iron mastering compressor. It started out in, in 2011 and we went through various versions and then in 2015 we thought sort of stopped the whole thing and we'll start it from scratch again, not from scratch, but we changed the, the housing size, we changed features, everything we learned from all in these years, we needed to re redo and improve on it. And so iron was one of those products that really took pretty much the longest time to really develop. The process always has two sides. You either have an idea of what the product should do. Let's say a simple thing. We want to make a pre-amplifier. That's pretty much a no-brainer. You need inputs, outputs, volume control, a few switches, features, all standard. There is no new things, new stuff going on. So that's easy, so to speak. It gets hard when you do processing because that is something you can do it by the cookbook. You can do filters by the cookbook. You can just stop looking at cookbooks and start it with, with what, how you want to do those things. And Don Lancaster wrote that in the book. There are about 2 million different ways to build a filter and only probably like only 2000 have ever been put into action and only 10 are used. So go out and experiment. There's so much to find. My name is Wolfgang Norman. I'm the founder of SPL and I'm designing pro audio equipment for mastering and recording business for more than 40 years. 
sound. It's still now, in these days, I'm using all the devices we design or I design in my own mastering studio. And when I'm sitting there and working on a project from the customer and the mastering, and I hooked up a device like a compressor, like a microphone, like, a, like whatever we design, and I'm working with this, the idea come, what can I change for the next device? It's more uh, not a question of sound, because the sound I have in mind is the major point. It has no noise. It has no total harmonic distortion. So I'm talking about a clean sound. What you give me as a mastering for the sound, it has to be when I play it back from the machine, it has to be the same as it is. I don't like when I put a device in that it changes the sound dramatically. For me, the key point is the dynamic. So when you're losing dynamic or when you're in a mastering process, you don't have to take care about devices. You, make, you have to be absolutely sure that the device is, is doing the thing you want. So for example, when I'm using transformers or when using a compressor with a tube and I'm switching in, then I know what the tube is doing, what the transformer is doing. This is a part of the mastering process, but it's not a question to say, when I'm using this and this are changing, I have the sound in mind. In the development process, I'm changing the components. This is the question of sound, what many people may be talking about. So when you have, for example, going back to your equalization system and you're changing resistors, you're changing capacitors, at that moment you're changing the sound. Because in an analog, in a linear equalization system, uh, the components are the key point for the sound, what you talk about sound. At this point, I say, yes, it's very important for me to create a sound by selecting the components. So when I'm changing, for example, uh, we're going for, we're taking 1000 Hertz and we're changing the capacitors. One capacitor maybe has an, another memory effect. So it has more total harmonic distortion. The other one is more some kind of laid back capacitor. So it's, it's more smooth. It takes the distortion away. And when you're using the components, by the components, I can create the sound of the total device. It's inside, it's a totally, I would say, isolated sound machine. But for the outside, the device has to be clean in the major point, total harmonic distortion, dynamic, and uh, face and all these uh, physical parameters. This is what's very important. I think when you take the older people like uh, George Massenburg, Bob Clement and Dave Hill and all these people were in a similar age than I am, they have the experience over the last 40, 50 years in the recording and development. They also have in their lab an I know that they have all these cases where all these old capacitors are in and they select them, they put them in and see how the sounds their devices are. If there is an AD converter or is it a compressor or is it a microphone preamplifier, I'm sure and I know that they're using these and selecting and make sure this could be the, uh, the, the perfect component. Well, you have those products that have an, an, an integral sound of its own because of the components they have been using, either being transformers or tubes or other type of coloring components. The PQ was, this one was the first equalizer that was really operating with the 120 volt rail op amps and the first product Wolf designed. So there was, for us, the question was what kind of behavior. I wouldn't call it sound because that leads in the wrong direction. But how does this EQ behave if you pr pretty much cannot really distort it? Because the headroom internally is so immense that you can ramp up three or four filters with like five, six, seven, ten dBs and, and, and it still doesn't clip. We don't have that benefit in the digital side because you have your zero dB FS ceiling and you cannot do anything about that. So you always have to push the level down. But imagine in the analog, you don't care, you just blow it. And it does that. So then it, it stays so open and natural that as a result, 
you do not hear that an EQ was used. So the sound remains unprocessed. Now take that for a quality. And that is, you find this in rare cases, because most standard equalizers running on standard rail get to the point of saturation because of their running out of headroom in their operational voltages. We don't. And that is then the point where the mastering engineer said, well, this is a tool we don't have yet. And they take that as their favorite, okay, I need to do something on the vocals, I need to do something in the bass range, I need to do something wherever. They do that and you listen to it and you go like, it still sounds as it was supposed to be like that. And you don't hear any EQ trying to straighten this out. Quote from George Massenburg, to Wolf. I listened to your PQ in the mastering place in Los Angeles and I have to say, uh, my EQs sound like semi-pro equipment compared to your PQ. And Wolf is a total George Massenburg fan. He was like stunned when he got this from him. Yeah, but that's how other guys perceive the technology. I remember in the 90s that people came to me and said, is there a life after Vitalizer? It's like a musician, you have a big hit. What is your second hit? You know, it's always that trauma that, that a big hit leaves after, after that's gone or it's still there, but everybody's expecting the next big thing. So that was the same with us. We sort of dangled around this for a time and we made more, let's say, regular products or and many versions of the Vitalizer. Then we, we started to compile these products, let's say when we did the first channel strips. We were like combining the microphone preamplifiers that we made with the Dynamax compressor, which we made with a regular EQ. So we had a full channel strip, all of that packed in. And the esser also an innovation that we made, face cancellation and de was is our thing and nobody else does it that way also a Wolf invention. We were comprising all these elements into, in, into one box and we thought hey, if we do that we sell that one box but we will not sell all the others individual boxes so is that good for us or not? And at one point you go like hey what the f just let's try it and see what happens and turns out channel one became a massive hit for us. It's now going into its mark I don't know how many marks we already have, but it's just continues to sell since 99. And that's, that's like 23 years it's out there. So that's, that's brilliant. And then in the same time, the Transient Designer came along. Transient Designer brought us on the map in America. So we're like a synonym for SBL as Transient Designer. And that really became so big that there were so many other companies coming up with similar products, also similarly named. So it's like, like a new genre of dynamic processes, a transient box, you know, that's, and that's, yeah, we, the invention was uh, with us, well, came from us. And it also was the thing that brought the software guys when the plugin started. And that brings us to where we are now. And when we started with Dirk and Brainworks, Plugin Alliance wasn't even around at the time. I remember that I received Dirk's mails and uh, when he was just working in his, I mean, he was in his very early stages. He came a long way since then, really cool. And uh, we went to an AIBC together in the car and while we're driving and we were thinking about, wouldn't it be cool to get the transient designer in software? And that's when we started working on it with uh, Michael Masberg at the time very clever guy and uh, the three of us we were working a lot in his place in, in his former place in his studio on the transient designer and that became yeah became came a huge hit and probably for Dirk it was one of the earliest products or it was the first products from a third party so the idea of doing third party products was actually derived from our starting out as SPL and Brainworks and we did the transient designer and that worked well and suddenly it opened, hey, there must be other companies with the same thing. Analog dudes want to do plugins. Who's going to do that? And that's where his idea sort of was, yeah, it, this could work and 
it, it worked out fantastically. So since then, we've, well, we have a friendship and we have a super good relationship and we keep on doing, uh, yeah, we keep on working together and I totally enjoy that.